When I imported my Japanese Sega Saturn in late 1994, I was about to embark on a journey that would shape my gaming future in a pretty profound way. But before things got really good, I had to go through the growing pains of a new console release. Or to put a finer point on it, waiting for new games. In those early days, I imported the big hitters as they released. But there was still what felt like an unbearable wait in between each one. In May of 1995, about six months into the run of the Saturn, Sega released Grand Chaser, a futuristic hover sled racer that looked absolutely killer in the gaming magazines. Being the arcade fan I am, I jumped on it the day it launched, paying roughly $80 for it once shipping was figured in. Four months later, it would be localized for the US market under the name Cyber Speedway, where it seemed to come and go with little fanfare. Today we are going to be taking a look at it and see where it sits among the other racers for the platform. Is it a stone cold classic worth picking up? Or is it something you can skip and never think about again? Let's find out. The story here is a tacked on tale of planets of the universe agreeing to settle their differences using combat racing instead of all out war. As the new driver for Earth, your job is to go in with your crew, take down your competition, and emerge as the new champion. In the story mode, your team gives you advice on the upcoming races, allows you to adjust the settings of your sled, and of course mocks you when you do poorly. The other contestants do the same, the typical attitude of 90s video games. The sled settings are pretty basic with you having options to change the feel of the steering, braking, engine power, and the type of special you use. The special allows you to have more boost, a stronger shield, or a more powerful weapon. The gameplay is mostly that of your typical combat racer. You race around tracks that are set on different planets trying to place number one. It supports the racing wheel and in turn the analog pad. Your weapons consist of missiles that you pick up around the track. These fire ahead of you and explode, providing a momentary disruption should your opponents run into it. Your shield is sort of a life bar. As you take damage from other racers and the environment it depletes. Should you lose it, you go boom and it's game over. The shoulder buttons are your boost jets, which allow you a quick strafe type attack so you can navigate sharp turns. Each race is five laps and there are five worlds with two tracks each. If the story mode is finished, your final race will take place on an 11th exclusive track that is not available in any other mode. There is also a time trial mode that acts as your practice option and there is a free run mode that pits you against the computer on any of the main 10 tracks. Free run also gives you more sled options. Should you want some multiplayer, Cyber Speedway has a one-on-one -on -one split screen mode as well. The visuals of Cyber Speedway were pretty decent for their day. As an early 32-bit game, it provided a glimpse of what was to come in many ways, looking and running better than the racing games we had already seen on the Saturn. The draw distance was still close but not offensively so, and the detail was fairly impressive. Each world is designed around a particular biome. You'll see water, ice, fire, sand, and even a gas giant. Some of these worlds provided environmental risks that can damage your sled, such as ice pillars or lava on the racing surface. The fact that it had a split screen mode was icing on the cake. But as an early Saturn title, it carried with it a number of problems. The performance is quite jumpy, if not all around unreliable. It feels like the frame rate is fluctuating constantly, sometimes going from really smooth to stuttering heavily. The track designs also make some really bad decisions on the geometry. There are hairpins and tight spaces that bring out the polygon pop-in in the worst of ways, with entire sections of the track just flickering into view moments before you were there. The color choices are also suspect, because it can be pretty difficult to discern where the turns are at. When you are powering through full speed, this can be extremely frustrating as you learn the tracks. 
The sleds themselves are also not anything special, despite being designed by Sid Mead. They are rectangular crafts with little defining features beyond the odd angle and curve. Even the coloring of the sleds is disappointing. Overall, you can't help but to feel that Cyber Speedway was really close to being a spectacular looking game had the developers at Next Tech been given more time. As it is, it was a decent looking early release that left you wanting a whole lot more. The biggest change between the Japanese and US versions of this game was the music. No kidding. In Japan, the music was composed by Koji Hayama, and it's all kinds of awesome. In the US, the music was done by Sega Music Group, a startup created by Spencer Nielsen that was performed by a group called Bygone Dogs. This stuff on its own wasn't bad, but it was a terrible fit for a hover sled racer like this. It had a feel and vocals that felt like it belonged in a Road Rash game, not what was presented in this one. Seriously, this is one of the greatest mismatches I think I've ever heard when it comes to video game music. Giving you an honest review of Cyber Speedway boils down to my 1995 opinion and the opinion I had shortly thereafter. In May of 1995 when I imported this, I was starved for Saturn releases. Daytona had come out the month before, but this was an entirely different experience, and Gale Racer had been out almost since launch, which wasn't exactly the best racing game ever. That meant that I enjoyed what was offered here quite a bit. It was easy to get into, the graphics were serviceable at the time, and the music was great. It also had 11 tracks in total, which dwarfed the other Sega published racers three times over. Its biggest fault was its non-existent difficulty that was entirely too easy. Hitting the wall and other racers didn't have much of an impact on your position. You sped back up and were right back in contention. You can see in my gameplay here I often hit the wall because I hadn't played it in so long which didn't seem to matter as I was still placing first and second regularly. But for a small stretch of time, Cyber Speedway here provided a nice distraction from Virtua Fighter Remix, A Stall, Panzer Dragoon, and Clockwork Knight, while waiting for Sega Rally, Virtua Cop, and Virtua Fighter 2 to show up. But it didn't take long for it to be shoved aside by better games in the same genre. By the end of 1995, we had options like Sega Rally, Hang On GP, F1 Challenge, High Velocity, Off-World Interceptor Extreme, Highway 2000, and Virtua Racing. What had been a genre with only a few options earlier in the year had suddenly grown to one with many. But I would be remiss to not bring up the impact Wipeout had that same year. While my feelings on Cyber Speedway were overall positive early on, it was Wipeout that showed me how much better a game like this should be. Wipeout was smoother, looked worlds better, and the gameplay was an improvement on an epic scale. You flowed around Wipeout's worlds like you were really above the track on a bed of air, and the cornering comes off so much better for it. Wipeout's courses were designed better, the soundtrack fit it like a glove, and the combat had so many more weapon options. It was when going back to Cyber Speedway after Wipeout that I realized how shallow and poorly executed the game was. It just does not hold up, 
and it lacked anything special in its makeup to set it apart. When Sega Rally was released, it was a massive graphical jump for Sega Saturn racing games, but something like the original Daytona USA still held its own in terms of how it played and felt. Cyber Speedway didn't do that. In an instant, it had gone from an okay early release to something you would never touch again because it was so thoroughly trounced in every area of its design by a vastly superior product. This goes for the Saturn release of Wipeout as well. Though not quite as smooth as the PlayStation version, it still has everything it needs to completely displace Cyber Speedway as the futuristic hover racer of choice on the Sega Saturn. Cyber Speedway was not well received by the vast majority of the gaming press in 1995. Some of the big publications said it was poorly executed and proclaimed an unfinished wipeout was already the better game, months before its retail release. GamePro wasn't completely down on it, but pretty much echoed the same narrative. Wipeout was coming, and it was going to be a much better game with a similar theme. Some magazines even reviewed them side by side praising Wipeout while absolutely eviscerating Cyber Speedway. I imagine this left sales of the Western versions of this game in the toilet, and it never received a sequel or follow-up afterwards. Most of you are probably a lot like me. You have a fondness for this game because of the timing of its initial release. But once the genre filled up with options and Wipeout burst onto the scene, Cyber Speedway slipped into that forgotten part of your gaming shelf, rarely to be thought of again. Trying to go back to it now serves as a reminder of the fierce competition Sega had in 1995. It wasn't just contending with the expectations of its fan base, but also the brilliant releases that seemed to never stop coming from competing platforms. Sega likely rushed Cyber Speedway to beat Wipeout to the market, but it needed more time in the oven to offer anywhere near the same impact. In the end, it has its place in the Saturn's history but it remains there overshadowed by a much better alternative. I'm Sigalord X. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.